Today we're going in a slightly different direction than usual, and we have a very special guest. Thibaut Serlet, co-founder and chief researcher for the Adrian Noble Group. He does a lot of work researching special economic zones and has some unique ideas about implementing carbon taxes to help combat climate change. Here at RockLogic, we're typically bigger fans of free market solutions and hesitant about the idea of carbon taxes, but we decided to have him on the show and have a conversation about it anyway. And it was a very pleasant experience. He had uh, some very interesting ideas and perspectives. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Tebow, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. So uh, before we get started here, uh, do you want to tell us a little about your organization, uh, what you're doing, and uh, what you're advocating for? Sure. So the Adrianople Group is a business research firm that focuses on special economic zones. Um, and private cities. Um, mm -hmm. Special economic zones are business parks that have been granted legal independence from their home countries. Mm -hmm. Usually, they occur in places that have had a, a history of, of, of problems attracting foreign investment. Um, so there's a whole gamut. Some of them are really awesome. Some of them are really troubled. And we help investors sort of identify the troubled ones and so forth. And we're most well known for making the world's first comprehensive map of every single SEZ in the world. Oh, very cool. And, and so when we're talking about special and uh, special economic zones, we're talking about places like Hong Kong, for example, which, uh, you know, it's, it's attached to mainland China, but it's its own separate government with its own separate taxes and stuff like that. That is exactly it. And in the U S doesn't really, the U S has some like export processing zones Mm -hmm. But the closest thing that the U.S. has to real special economic zones would actually be the uh, Native American reservations. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting analogy there. Okay. And um, um, what, 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 is, uh, what, what is it that you're trying to do? I've, I've heard that there's, uh, uh, there's been some interest in uh, employing uh, various different tax regimes to try and help uh, curb climate change or help combat climate change. you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. So there's a lot of... There's two sort of discussions that are happening at once. Mm -hmm. The first is the OECD passed recommendations for a global 15% minimum corporate tax. And there's a lot of talk about special economic zones as tax havens, because many offer tax incentives, mm -hmm. needing to change their ways. And this is really good because now they have to compete by having, you know, faster permit approvals, by digitizing their services. They can't just like, I'll have a 0% corporate tax rate. So, but hmm. it's going to hurt a lot of zones. The other thing that's been happening is there's a lot of talk also amongst OECD circles about implementing global carbon taxes. So hmm. I recently wrote an article for Reuters where I suggested marrying the two concepts and trialing a lot of the various carbon tax proposals on a small scale in special economic zones. Uh, it's not going to save the world. You know, it's it's obviously a few business parks, but what it will do is it will tell you, uh, it, it will allow policymakers to develop the most efficient and effective way to implement carbon taxes. And although the impact on the environment will be symbolic, in terms of what we can learn from trialing it, um, I think it can be very helpful for the world at large. Okay. Um I'm not, I'm not going to ask the question of what is a carbon tax. Obviously, I know, and I'm sure my audience, <laughs> and I'm sure my audience does. But um, uh, in, in regards to carbon tax um, and how they're, uh, how, how would they be implemented in these special economic zones? And have there been any examples in where uh, something like this has been implemented? Good question. So um, there's no examples where special economic zones are currently trailing carbon taxes. Okay. What they are, though are a lot of green special economic zones, um, mm. zones that either are or claim to be, you know, carbon negative or carbon neutral. And the idea is that because these zones are manufacturing heavy, these are actually the polluting industries, mm. because they're confined in the space, you can really monitor everything. Um, there's a lot of zones that make claims, but when you dig into it, it's kind of shady. Um, there's some zones in uh, Costa Rica that are there's a zone called green park in costa rica that actually is doing it for real mm. um, there's another zone in south africa that's doing it for real there's some proposals for zones in scotland that seem pretty credible uh mm. post-brexit zones interestingly enough 
Um, so there's varying degrees of credibility. And a lot of these zones already are tax havens, right? A lot of these zones already have 0%, but are already carbon neutral, either through offsets or through actual sort of mitigation strategies. Um, the zone in South Africa, for example, it's called Atlantis Special Economic Zone, if you're interested. One major issue is that South Africa has a crap power supply. So they've installed solar panels and solar panel farms, and they're using flywheels for energy storage. It's not super efficient, but um, mm -hmm. they actually are sort of legitimate, you know, carbon reduction strategies that actually have a tangible benefit for the zone itself. For sure. Um, yeah, obviously, I, I have some differing opinions, uh, you know, from you in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, carbon tax. And this is probably just because of a I, I come from a very American uh, perspective. Um, I used to live in California. I live in Texas now. Uh, if you go and do the whole pie chart in terms of where we get our energy, I think like two thirds of it comes from the burning of fossil fuels. So obviously implementing a carbon tax here would have some uh, some very interesting effects. But before I get into that, uh, before I kind of kind of get into that, um, I guess uh, have the, uh, have has this has uh, this been implemented anywhere, not just in special economic zones, but ha in, in the places in the countries, like you mentioned, South Africa, I know Singapore recently uh, adopted uh, carbon tax uh, uh, carbon tax policy. I know C uh, New Zealand does. Uh, Canada has some uh, some, uh, some semblance of a carbon tax. But what uh, what I've noticed is a lot of the uh, places where this is being implemented are in a lot of um, developed countries, uh, particularly in like places like North America, Western Europe. Uh, you know, in some other countries like that, where they don't really have a large manufacturing sector and their primary exports are like things like the financial sector or maybe they maybe it's agriculture, maybe it's something else. Uh, how do you see this affecting like heavy industrialized uh, manufacturing sectors? Because my, my biggest credit, one of my biggest criticisms, uh, and we'll get into the other ones later, is I would I, I don't see this being implemented in really heavily industrialized uh, countries like the United States, like India, like China, where we have some of the more polluting, uh, you know, industries. So do you see something like this being implemented and, and how would how would you structure it to where it could actually work in these countries? Look, so I have a very simple answer for you in terms of from a practical perspective. I am, if you want to use the Internet slang, very black pilled on modern okay. politics, right? I think that um, you know, a lot of this, these things are not going to be implemented. What I'm more interested in doing is getting a few pilots going so that people 100 years from now can point and say, hey, look, at least a few people got it right in the early 21st century. Um, in terms of the implementation, let's look at things, I think, from a very, I'm not like the other carbon tax people. A lot of these people are people who think that the government should be the primary driving force in economic development. Um, okay. I think a major issue that is, is right now happening is overtaxation. And overtaxation, what's, what, what's all of these people are always talking about raising the tax rates. But the more you raise the tax rates, the more you incentivize people, to f the, the more basically Deloitte makes money because all of these corporations hire Deloitte to find tax loopholes. The higher the tax rates are, the more there is an incentive to lobby for more complicated tax systems. So I think that I'm not just suggesting adding carbon taxes. I think that's quite stupid. Another thing that you correctly point out is that the carbon tax rates would have to be very high for them to be effective at all in reducing the, the, the pollution. So mm. what I'm suggesting is replacing things like that, replacing the income tax, abolishing most existing tax systems and replacing them not necessarily with a true carbon tax, but with you know a plastic tax and electricity tax taxes on things that actually have you know externality and 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 pollution and so forth. So um, okay, that's so you, that's sort of the solution, and I think that would make it much more palatable in these countries with emerging markets, right? So let's look at at uh, this OECD 15% global minimum corporate tax is going to be devastating. I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. What's mm -hmm. going to happen is that the special economic zones are going to say, fine, we'll tax you 15%, but we'll give you free rent. We'll subsidize the workers. They're going to give it back in corporate subsidies. So as a result, all of the small businesses are going to, mm. pardon my French, so to speak, 
uh, get screwed over, right? Mm. And all the big businesses are going to benefit. It's going to be a disaster. So I think that if you simply replace this with an electricity tax and are compliant with the 15% corporate minimum tax by taxing electricity and plastic use, you get a much better outcome. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. So, just so I'm mis uh, not mischaracterizing here, you're not uh, you're not advising that we should add this on with all the other taxes here, because I mean, if you ask me, I think we're taxed too much and we have too many taxes. So, you would basically just kind of simplify this into one flat carbon tax, essentially. Oh. I'm not calling right. for this to be an addition. I'm calling for the to, to, to clarify. I I think that overtaxation is a huge problem. And uh, I, I actually see this as sort of a compromise that a lot of, you know, people who on the side of the taxes are too high and on the side of carbon taxes, well, let's just get rid of all of these overcomplicated tax systems and replace them with carbon taxes. And the SEZs obviously would be a trial run, but for it to be actually effective, you'd have to do it at a national scale. Sure, sure. And I, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. I and mean, you and I actually may have some agreement on there. We may we may di uh, we, uh, we may have uh, different opinions on how to implement it. I'm kind of more in favor of more of like a consumption tax, you know, just rating people on, you know, what they spend or maybe even a flatter tax system like uh, they do in some other countries. But um, I, I can kind of see uh, I can kind of see what you're talking about here. And as far as special economic zones, I, I know a few examples are, are, the, are of some that are trying to be developed. I know Peter Thiel uh, has been trying to I, I forget what the name of it is. I think it's called Prospera. They're, they're trying to develop a special economic zone within. Um, he, he, so uh, so what, what it is, okay. is that Peter, my, my wife actually runs that fund for Peter Thiel. Oh, no um, kidding. OK. Yeah. And it's not what it is, is that there's a VC fund funded by Peter Thiel called Pronomos. And yes. That fund uh, invested in Prospera as one of their investments in other zones. But but Peter Thiel is not. It, it's a few degrees of connection. The media is hyping it. Peter Thiel invests as one of, you know, several investors in this fund, which is one uh, of several investments invests in Prospera. OK. And have they looked at uh, implementing what you're kind of advocating for? Or are they going in a different direction? Um, you know, the the situation with Prospera is. Um, it, it's this very early zone, right? They have like a co-working center that's very nice. Actually, a lot of our employees live uh, very close by uh, oh, to nice. Prospera. They're actually Hondurans. Um, but, but, but a lot of it is quite early, and that's not at all the direction in which they're going. No, Interesting. It, it would be more like, but look, a lot of these like very libertarian, there's this movement called the Charter Cities Movement, which is yes. mostly people coming from a libertarian background who want to build these like very radical new cities, um, you have to understand that you're, you're constantly seeing media hype. And it's funny because the media is like, oh, look, it's these evil billionaires that are going to take over the world. But when you actually do consulting for the project, look behind, it's all uh, it's all a paper a tiger, right? It's all just CGI models with yeah. like a 2% chance of ever happening. So I yeah. wouldn't really worry about that. No, the thing is that if you look at real special economic zones, the low end estimates are that 40% of the world's manufacturing at some stage of production occurs in them already, and 60% is the high-end estimate from the International Labor Organization. Um, really? So there's 5,000 SEZs in, in 70 countries, and if you look at a bunch of countries, they account for 60, 70, 80% of the manufacturing. So I think it's actually going to be implemented in a few of those forward-thinking ones, not in these, you know, I think charter cities are really cool, don't get me wrong, but I don't really think that this is like too relevant for the short term. I understand. So it, it's your contention that a carbon tax would not necessarily affect um, ma heavily manufactured. Like, I, I guess we'll, we'll put it in this perspective. Would you consider Shenzhen to be a uh, special economic zone? Uh, well, Shenzhen you know? is a textbook special economic zone. OK. Um, uh, 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 it's it's the, it's the zone that they always give as an example. Um mm. But Shenzhen is complicated because in China, all the zones are divided into subzones, and each little neighborhood in China has this very. Um, by the way, China something very fascinating. Uh, the I, I saw some estimates that was done by um, Douglas Jihua Zhang, uh, and they were very back of the envelope. But it's something like sixty percent of all of China's economic growth post nineteen eighty has been in its special economic zones. Yes, um, you know, which when you allow capital, if you have the, a, pop, a population of 1.2 billion people 
with complete central planning and there's capitalism in a few areas, it's, it's clear mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, what I think it's, but, but, but a lot of the innovative zones are not in China. A lot of the innovative zones are in places like Indonesia, which actually has a new big green zones initiative that could do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's places, uh, the, the, the zones in China are run by the government. The zones in mm -hmm. countries like Indonesia, India, um, Colombia, uh, Costa Rica, all of these zones are fully privately developed. So what I think it is, it's going to be one of these zones that negotiates on a case-by-case -case basis with the government to implement this. Now, okay. to answer your question, would it affect manufacturing? Mm. Um, what it's going to do is that it's going to... Let's, let's talk about it on a large scale, right? Because on a zone, it's obviously going to only attract companies that already think that they can deal with this if it's like on a business park. But mm. once it's implemented on a large scale, right now, the way that the corporate income tax works is that you can, it, it's actually a tax on revenue, not a tax on profits, because otherwise companies would just, you know, which is, which, which sucks if you're like a grocery store that has a 2% profit margin, whereas, you know, Target might have, you know, $50 billion of revenue, but they're spending $49.5 billion and they're actually really like scrounging on everything. Um, mm. So what they do is that with the corporate income tax, they allow you to write off certain expenses. Mm. So this creates this perverse incentive where corporations, instead of saving money and planning for the future, just want to spend on fripperies. They have these plastic business cards, these this junk, these hoodies, all of these air-conditioned offices. So now what you're doing by, by, by shifting towards uh, carbon taxes is that you're actually creating an incentive for corporations to stop spending on fripperies mm -hmm. and instead to save money for the future. You want to cut your tax rate? Fine, you can do this by getting rid of all of this plastic packaging and going to, you know, biodegradable packaging if it's like a plastic tax as a proxy for a carbon tax. Mm. And you actually create much better incentives. I can certainly understand the logic there. And yes, we do have a lot of, uh, and yeah, that's more or less how businesses, you know, operate here. You know, they, they can write off a private jet or anything like that because, um, you know, there, there's an economic incentive to, you know, you could write that off your taxes. It's a business expense. You use it to travel to wherever you go to do business. So I, I can understand the logic there in terms of reducing, uh, you know, certain types of economic activity that might incur more waste. However, and again, I'm. I hope you understand. I'm. I, I'm not. I'm not shooting this down. I'm just coming from a very different perspective here in sure. terms of because when I when I when I bring somebody on and when we talk about something like this and uh, believe me in this country there there's a there's a bit of a debate on it. Uh, it, it really kind of boils down to how is this going to affect. Uh, lower income people. We, we can we can agree that this will have an effect on higher income people and corporations and stuff like that. But uh, I, I lived in California for five years. Uh, their electric rates over there are uh, in, in some places three times higher than the national average here in the United States. And a lot of that kind of stems from uh, from public policy, uh, there's a renewable energy portfolio standard that a lot of the utility companies have to operate here. Here in Texas, it's a lot cheaper because, you know, we have a very deregulated grid. We, we can choose which our companies are. Uh, we can, in some cases, we can choose where our electricity comes from. I live in Fort Worth, and uh, we're literally where the studio is. We're about 35, maybe 40 miles, roughly 50 or 60 kilometers uh, from a uh, nuclear power station. So a lot of the electricity that comes from that line comes from nuclear power. It wouldn't be carbon emitting. But even though my electricity would be clean in that sense, my utility company also produces energy from natural gas and coal and other resources. So while I'm getting clean electricity from that nearby plant, I'm not being charged as if I would be, because that company would essentially be getting, I guess my point I'm trying to get across is, is that one of the negatives that I see, or I, I guess a couple of the negatives is one, typically when a utility company here in the United States, and I, and I can only speak for the country that I reside in, I can't speak for Europe or any of these other countries, but in the United States, when you decommission a nuclear power station, that cost is basically is picked up by the consumer when you're when you're implementing like a new solar plant or you're imp or you're trying to decommission coal or anything like that or you're getting charged a tax rate because you have way too much coal on the grid the, the utility doesn't pay for that that gets uh, the, the, that gets charged to the rate payer and so my, my electricity rates would go up uh, and I know that there are people out there who are who are high net worth individuals people like 
Elon Musk, people like, uh, you know, Bill Gates. But in all fairness, uh, the amount of money that they spend on, on energy, on electricity, is very low by comparison to, say, the average worker or the working poor. So I guess, h- how would you implement a carbon tax in such a way that would not be as regressive to ratepayers and consumers of electricity? All right. So let's, let's, there's a few different issues. Okay. Number one, I think, is, the, is a carbon tax regressive? And it totally is regressive. So okay. the first thing, because what's going to happen is that you're taxing the way that you're paying taxes is through basically more expensive products, right? Because you're mm. taxing the carbon intensive manufacturing things. And let's look at the realistic carbon productions, car- carbon usage. Well, sure, rich people might have, you know, a Lamborghini or something. But at the end of the day, they're not going to eat that much more meat, for example, which is a carbon intensive production thing mm. than somebody who is who is poorer, relatively speaking, because thanks to modern agriculture techniques, for example, meat is quite inexpensive. Mm. So what you would have to do if you're implementing it on a large scale would be similar to Milton Friedman's uh, 1988 proposal for a uh, negative consumption tax. What he suggests is that you okay. basically give everybody UBI, but then you tax consumption instead of income. And the two evens mm. out. Now, the problem, of course, it creates another problem, right? Where that there could be like some people who like have problems where they just like try to live off of that. And it's just supposed to like offset the impact of your of your taxes, not necessarily mm. be something that you live on. So you'd have to market it not as UBI, but as like a tax offset. You know, you'd really have to manage expectations that you're not supposed to live on it. And everybody would get, you know, two thousand dollars a month flat. And that would sort of compensate, you know, some people who consume very little would probably get a bit more. Some people who consume more would probably still have to pay more. Um, So that's the first thing about, yes, it is regressive. And there are some sort of hackish short-term solutions. In the more long-term, here in Switzerland, there's something quite awesome. And it's that all of the food is locally produced. Um, One of the national dishes of the canton in which I live in, St. Gallen, is steak mm. tartare, which for Americans is just raw beef. It's like sushi, but with cow. You could never do this in the U.S. because the meat is all factory farmed and exported over long yeah. distances. What That's you're true. doing now is that you're incentivizing more local production and you're also decorporatizing it because when you incentivize mm. lo- local production, you have more small local producers instead of big, large-scale sort of corporate producers. So you're also, mm. you know... The the, 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 the the central planning solution to this is to pass a law. Let's just ban meat. You know, that, that's I, I'm sure that there's going to be some European countries that try this in a decade. Right. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I, like I hate, I hate that idea. I hate that idea. <laughs> actually, actually, not not only do I love meat, my producer, uh, she's on a carnivore diet. So all she eats is meat and she lost like, uh, uh, you know, she, she lost a lot of weight. I'm actually on a keto diet myself. So where well, I eat almost go. only so. meat and cheese. So, yeah, okay, well, um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it would do, right, is that you, you cre- it, it's, it's obviously a horrible solution. With this, so, so why making this proposal is because a lot of the environmentalism stuff is misguided. My philosophy is, and this is from somebody who's worked uh, uh, in the green energy space. I've, I, I used to work for a utility assessment firm where I try to qualify homeowners and, and businesses in California for a lot of green energy subsidies to go solar and, and things of that nature. And one of the things I realized was uh, if you're in the market to sell electricity, um, and if all, all you can do is uh, sell electricity, you're not going to make a lot of money. If you can make really cheap electricity, and if you can make a bunch of other products that are much more economical than the way we currently do it right now with coal or natural gas, that is going to be very, uh, very interesting. You know, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, uh, and, and in terms of discouraging waste, I mean, I... Could not agree with you more. I don't want to keep digging big holes over here and making big piles over here. I want, if anything, if we can avoid digging the holes in the first place, and if we can just take advantage of some of these big piles, and you know, uh, create some sort of an incentive structure to you know convert them into something else. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's more energy content in the coal ash tailings, not the coal itself, but the actual waste tailings from coal because there's trace amounts of thorium and uranium in there. But right now it's just kind of mixed in with a bunch of oxide metals and rare earth materials and all this other stuff. Again, still very valuable stuff, but 
with with uh, with how expensive electricity is, even in by U.S. standards, it's not particularly economical to do that. So I could see some ancillary benefits to implementing what you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, or, or framing a carbon tax in that particular scenario to try and incentivize engaging in stuff like that. So I guess my other question would be, it just kind of going into that thought process, because uh, we, we've talked about how carbon taxes could discourage consumers and discourage companies from engaging in wa- uh, in wasteful processes, you know, like, uh, you know, buying too many p- plastic products or whatever. But do you see any, like, uh, c- could there be any tax breaks for engaging in stuff like investing in advanced nuclear or engaging in waste recycling technologies, like cleaning up landfills and converting it into synthetic fuels well, or something like that? Well, the thing is that what you want to avoid is the government going about and creating specific tax exemptions, right? You really want to okay. avoid um, government micromanagement. That leads to a bunch of unintended consequences. Mm. However, if you okay. are talking about creating the ash tailings, what you're, the, 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 the reason why I like this policy suggestion is that the complicated part is in deciding what to measure, which is really why you need to go into an SEC. But as long as you're measuring the right you know, dozen metrics, um, you can actually mm. basically be creating tax breaks for stuff like that sort of organically, right? Un- unofficially creating tax breaks. Um, so I- I'll give you a few examples. The um, okay. Obviously, one of the biggest problems with electricity is the storage, where there's this overconsumption during peak hour and during the dead hours because the electricity production, because of most methods, is relatively constant. So the, producing mm. this green carbon neutral steel is a great solution to basically store energy, so to speak, or, you know, mining Bitcoin or something, right? So what you'd be doing is incentivizing a lot more that of that. You would be also incentivizing long-term investment. Um, another thing is that what Obama, the Obama administration did of just banning coal in sort of this very blanket, you know, everything is a nail if you've got a hammer away, really wasn't necessarily this 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 very economic because a there was no good alternative for the workers and while the intention of the policy was definitely laudable it basically just made the u.s less competitive because suppose that there's a complete ban on coal that's like and there's 100 countries in the world and 99 do it well the incentive for that one country to cheat increases so much because the price of coal drops so i'm sure that from an Mm. economics perspective just banning coal in the u.s you know, reduces the coal price internationally and just gives China more of an incentive to pollute. So what you'd be doing is you'd be incentivizing long-term investment into carbon capture. Um, I have a, I, I had a, I worked with a company a few years back that was taking all of the emissions from coal plants and then using that to manufacture bromine, which is used in all sorts of industrial applications. Um, you know, you incentivize okay. more carbon sinking technologies, you know, and... Also, here's another point I make about coal and plastic that I've never seen anyone make. Um, Coal and, uh, more importantly, hydrocarbons, um, liquid hydrocarbons, are very useful in the manufacture of all sorts of plastics, especially the very inert laboratory plastics. What if 200 years from now we need very large quantities of inert plastics and We've burnt all of our, like idiots, we burnt all of our, 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 our hydrocarbons on coal and we don't have enough inert plastics to make spaceships to explore, you know, the underwater oceans of Europa, right? It's, yes. there could be all sorts of other really unintended consequences of burning fossil fuels besides just the carbon aspects of it. It's an interesting point. And, and yeah, you, you and I, I, I don't think there's a lot that, I mean, there, there's some things we disagree on, but we I don't think there's a lot that we one disagree yet, on. I, <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, well, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you where we agree on in regards to China. I mean, one of the one of the things that, that I've often you know discussed with many of my peers and obviously on this channel is right now in the United States, we're kind of uh, we're kind of uh, feeling the side effects of 32 years worth of bad economic policy. You know, we've we've outsourced 15 million manufacturing jobs uh, to China and while I'm not anti-globalist and I, and I definitely have a lot of uh, positive things to say about, you know, globalism and, and participating in a global economy, I do recognize that when you have things like the pandemic 
and all these supply shortages that we were suffering through last year, we're starting to come to some uh, realization that maybe it's not the best idea to have one country or a small group of company uh, countries uh, manufacture all of our products for us and then ship those products overseas uh, to the United States or to Europe or wherever. I mean, because of how bad the supply shortages were, you have uh, you have companies like Sony, like li- literally. Uh, air shipping game consoles during the holidays because the price of sending something over by a shipping container was so expensive that it actually incentivized using air freight uh, to send PlayStations over to, to Western Europe. And I, I don't particularly think that, that that is particularly constructive, but we are starting to see some very positive ramifications of that, that we're starting to rebuild foundries here in the United States. We're getting back into the uh, manufacturing of semiconductors, uh, we're going to be opening up a rare earth refinery here in the United States, assuming some other policy things happen here in regards to the rare earth industry. Uh, we might actually get back into the business of manufacturing rare earths again, and that would also lead to some other positive benefits in terms of incentivizing, you know, recycling thorium waste to power molten salt reactors and things of that nature. But uh, I, I do agree if this isn't implemented correctly, you are going to run into a situation where we can't really run any of our manufacturing. We can't run our steam, uh, steel mills or an aluminum smelters. And China's just going to basically continue being the world's factory and making all of that stuff. So we're going to, we're going to negatively um, uh, be affected by that. I, I guess, um, I, I, I guess I'm just trying to find examples to sort from because this is obviously something I'll be talking about uh, in years to come. Uh, you've definitely opened my eyes to some different perspectives here, which is uh, which again, thank you for that. Um, I just I'm just trying to I'm just trying to think if there's been any examples on where this has been implemented in, in, in I guess your most oh. ideal scenario. Like you talked about South Africa, would that be the best example, no. or are there other countries no, 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 too? No, not at all. Um, could could okay. I give a bit more of a maybe a, a dark side? I think of what I think is probably going to happen to America and also some positive hope for the world. Sure. So, um, <laughs> sure. so I actually, I, I don't, I don't know. I, okay. I'm actually a dual U S French citizen. Um, and I actually, I used to I actually oh, wow. used to, okay. to live in the U S and I'm kind of, nice. one of the reasons why I actually moved to Switzerland is because I actually kind of see the decline of the Western world uh, 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 coming about. Mm. Right. I, I, see, I see sort of mm-hmm. America, but also the European Union, the very same problems happening in both. And um, this, mm. was all, this was all predicted uh, by Hayek in his 1946 book, The Road to Serfdom, where he talks about sort of mm. Hitler's ride to authoritarianism. And he points out that mm. typically what you see is that you see government micromanagement of the economy, uh, which causes all of this discontentment which causes the government to become more authoritarian, which causes more micromanagement, you know, and my main hobby mm. is, is actually the study of medieval history outside of this. I'm, I'm a medieval, mm. I actually write a medieval book review blog Why every, now it's more like every two weeks, but oh. I, I review a book about medieval history every two weeks. <laughs> I've been doing this for about five years. And what's fascinating about what Hayek writes about the, this, this economic mismanagement and sort of authoritarian downward spiral is that, it's common to every single civilization, even in pre-industrial times. You see this with the Abbasid Caliphate. Mm. Um, you might see it with the Roman Empire, though there's not necessarily enough written evidence. But you see this, you know, with Florence and the Renaissance. It's it's quite fascinating the degree to which it repeats. So that's the doom mm. and gloom. But the good news is that there's actually a lot of countries right now that are actually at the opposite side of the cycle. There's a lot of countries where, um, and, and it's not, you know, a, a left-wing, right-wing things, right? In times when countries are rising, the, the right-wing people improve economic freedom, and then the left-wing people improve civil liberties, and all liberty goes up. In times when countries are declining, the right sort of clamps down on civil liberties, and the left clamps down on economic liberties, mm. and it all goes down. It, it, you know, it's, it's really sort of a, from an ecosystem perspective. And what's quite, what's quite, a lot of the source for optimism is that what you said about manufacturing being centralized in China, this is no longer the case. Over the last five years, um, people still talk about this as the case, but now labor costs in China are so high. Uh, China, what the Chinese government is doing with the social credit scores and you know the genocide of the Uyghurs, mm. companies have really bad PR. What happened with Foxconn and the suicide nets, this scared a whole bunch of companies mm. out of China. Uh, it's now becoming way mm. more decentralized. It's going to Vietnam. You know, there's a lot of places 
like Switzerland that are consistently doing everything right. There are a lot of places like Singapore that are just doing everything right that are sort of first world developed countries that are going to stay, you know, first world developed. And another thing mm-hmm. is that at the Adrian Opel Group, our employees, well, we have a lot of people. We have very few Americans. I think we have three or four people from Europe and the US. We have people from Rwanda, people from Nigeria, people from Swaziland, people from Colombia, from we actually have several Venezuelan refugees and people in Venezuela. We have uh, Indians. We have Hondurans. You know, we're we're super duper international in the emerging markets. And the perspective that I'm getting from them, it's not a doom and gloom world. Colombia was a country that was ridden by war, ridden by FARC, and they've already gone through their downward spiral, right? Now what Colombia is doing is that they're adopting free markets. Corruption is decreasing. Uh, there's there's less and less social mm-hmm. conflicts. Yeah, there's some anti-police protests happening last year, but that's actually improving the situation. Mm-hmm. You have Rwanda. Rwanda is the next. You always hear about how 